How does Minecraft create those giant, beautiful worlds? As one of the biggest, most successful games on the planet, Minecraft needs no introduction, but Here's one anyway. The game about pickaxing through blocks has sold over 54 million copies, and you know, it's even made its way onto the game show set. Minecraft's maker Mojang was recently purchased by Microsoft to the tune of two and a half billion dollars, propelling its creator Marcus Person, AKA Notch, into this fabulous lifestyle of the rich and famous. He recently outbid Jay-Z and Beyonce for a house in the Beverly Hills. One of the reasons for Minecraft's continued popularity is that it never gets old. If you tire of the environment that you're playing in, you can just start over and the game will generate an entirely new world for you. These worlds are massive with breathtaking areas that are geographically distinct. They have diverse biomes such as tropics, frozen tundra, forests, and mountainous terrain that are totally unique to your game. I was really curious about how all of this works, so for today's episode, we're peeling back the layers to the world of Minecraft block by block. The way Minecraft builds its protean worlds is by what's known in game design as procedural generation. It sounds complicated, but procedural generation is simply when a formula is used to randomly create a game's content. You see it in the vast prehistoric planets of No Man's Sky, the shape-shifting ruins in Spelunky, and the variety of ledges that we fall from in Worms. Because the content is random, you can play it forever, metaphorically speaking. But here's the difficulty. Complete randomness is no good. If the game generated things completely at random, you'd end up with nonsense environments where cats live in the ocean and trees grow upside down. This is where procedural generation comes in. It's a way to govern the randomness and make it obey some basic rules. An easy way to think about this, according to Daniel Cook, designer of Triple Town, is as a dress up paper doll. You have a number of shirts, hats, scarves, and pants, which can be combined on the body to create a large variety of different outfits. But then there are items that you would never match together, like cowboy boots with swim trunks or a top hat with a tank top, unless you're a runway designer. Replace the shirts and jeans with green hills and mountains, and then you start to have a very rudimentary version of Minecraft. Every game uses procedural generation differently, so the way that Minecraft assembles its terrain is uniquely its own. But the procedural generation in Minecraft and many other games is based on a very basic kind of procedural generation known as Perlin noise. NYU professor Ken Perlin originally invented Perlin noise to create the computer graphics for Tron. Originally it was used to create textures for computer graphics, similar to something that you'd find in Photoshop to give an object a speckled appearance. But since then, it's found a second home in video games where it's used to generate things like terrain. The way Perlin noise works is by generating something called a noise map, which is just a flat surface covered in dots of different shades that are grouped together in semi-random patterns. The result is that they sort of look like a topographical map. And surprise, surprise, that's how they're actually used in Minecraft. First, the game creates a noise map. Then the computer begins smoothing it over into a more believable landscape, starting with the big chunky parts and working its way down to the finer details. You can actually see this happening as the game creates your world from scratch. In Minecraft's first pass, the computer simply reads these dots and decides what is the ground and what is sky, with the stipulation that the sky is always above the ground. You know, like real life. Then it overlays that with another noise map. It reads the dots, decides how rough the land is, and now you have a distinction between valleys, hills, and craggy areas. Next, it adds the small touches, like lakes, trees dotting the mountainside, and a happy little cloud. There's a lot more to it, obviously, but that's the general idea. If you want to learn more about Perlin Noise, we'll link to some resources in the description, and if you want to hear from the man Perlin himself, check out this talk that he gave on computer graphics. Okay, that's really cool, and Minecraft can make beautiful worlds, but how exactly does all this procedural generation make games better? Well, for one thing, they gave games a huge sense of scale. The size of Minecraft's worlds, for instance, is vast. There's actually a YouTube channel that documents one man's insane quest to reach the outer edge of Minecraft. So far, he's put in over 180 hours, and at the current pace, he'll get there in like, 
22 years. But it's not just a sense of overwhelming vastness. Procedural generation creates fertile grounds for what's known as emergent behavior. Emergent behavior is when a game behaves in a way that the designer hadn't intended, but it's also when wind and sand interact in the desert to create sand dunes, or when groups of drivers take detours to avoid areas of high traffic. In games, here's how emergent behavior works. There are thousands of tiny rules underlying procedural generation telling it where and where not to put stuff. Sometimes this causes problems and has to be sorted out, but other times the rules overlap in unexpectedly brilliant ways. So when Notch added wolves to Minecraft, he was pleasantly surprised to find that they would chase after sheep, although he hadn't explicitly programmed them to. Another example is how a stray cougar would randomly clear out a stronghold for you in Far Cry, or how burning villages would spread to wildfires. This lends games a stroke of serendipity and a feeling that they have life. Warren Spector calls these types of games engines of perpetual novelty because new and unexpected ways to play them are constantly popping up, which is one of the big reasons that people become so enamored with Minecraft. If this all seems like a little too much and a little bit scary, I don't blame you. If computers can come up with ingenious gameplay and create huge, beautiful worlds in Minecraft, it's only a matter of time before they start taking the place of lots of creative fields, right? Who needs artists or level designers when you have algorithms to create it for you? But that's the wrong way to look at it. Daniel Cook says that like any technology, the software multiplies human efforts, but you still need an artist at the heart of the aesthetic process. So don't think of it as computers taking over art, but as humans using computers to produce art that they could never do on their own. So what do you think? Should every game have procedural generation like Minecraft? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. A big thanks to Daniel Cook of Spry Fox and Matt Parker of NYU's Game Center for helping us out with this episode. You should absolutely check out Spry Fox's game, Road Not Taken. And if you live near the NYC area, like I do, NYU's Game Center has a lot of amazing events. You should absolutely check it out. We'll link to both in the description. Anyway, I'll see you all next week. Hey everybody, as you can see, I'm not in the studio today. I'm actually in San Francisco for the Game Developers Conference, but that doesn't mean we can't get to some comments. Last week, we talked about the balance of Halo's guns, and let's take a look at what you all had to say. Seth Sheeran notes that the older Halo games were much more like strategy games. Um, they required you to have maybe a little bit more patience, um, to wait until your enemy's shields were down. It had this real tactical element to it, and uh, there's certainly been a big evolution, obviously, and a lot's changed over the last 15 years over Halo's life cycle. So what you see now is uh, Halo trying to keep up with other first-person shooters, but Seth will always be there for the uh, first round of Halo games. Totally agree with you. The Hilary argues that the balance things that I talked about in the episode actually go far beyond just the guns and extend into other areas. I didn't really get into the vehicles. Clearly they have a system all to themselves. Remember in the last Halo episode, I talked about the balance of each individual system between the uh, the military guns, which had their own kind of rock, paper, shotgun sort of system. And then on top of that, you had the randomness of the Covenant guns. And then you layer on top of that, you have the vehicles. And I didn't even get a chance to talk about the level design as well. Um, a verticality, for example, is a big thing that designers often play with, um, being able to take certain um, certain vantage points and whatnot. So yeah, you're totally right on in terms of identifying some other systems that add the level of complexity, um, adds that level of complexity that makes Halo so beloved. So to Pop 67 thinks that they've caught me in a little bit of a contradiction. Um, so in my previous episode about Smash Brothers, I argued that the unbalance of the system, um, the level of chaos and randomness, and that was part of the hallmark of the game. And in my Halo episode, I'm arguing that balance is a, is a hallmark of good design. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that you're kind of on one spectrum or the other. Um, I, I'd like to think that out of Smash Brothers, unbalance comes this sort of like level of balance. It's really a question of whether or not you turn the balancing uh, aspects of the game over to the player or whether the designer tries to create them themselves. So I do think that you can sort of have these two, two sort of poles where you have something that's chaotically unbalanced but, or something that's systematically balanced and in each individual case you can have something that still is altogether a lot of fun to play. Hayden Naughton astutely points out that I didn't talk about grenades. Um, one important thing to remember is that when designers um, play test particular weapons they're often using them as 
an antidote for certain types of player behaviors. And as Hayden points out, um, any kind of grenade, the reason why those weapons exist is that it prevents players from clumping together or from holding a particular position for a long period of time. Um, because you, you're not required, you can use a grenade even after you die, for example, to flush someone out of a particular position. That's how they were used in warfare as well. So yeah, I didn't get a chance to talk about the grenades, but trust me, they're incredibly important as well.